A good place to start is with Hegel's critique on Kant's reasoning regarding the idea of the thing in itself and his concept of the noumenal realm. Immanuel Kant posited that human reasoning is limited to what we can perceive through our senses, and he argued that speculation on profound questions about the universe or God is futile. Kant maintained that our understanding is subjective and finite, and we cannot truly grasp the thing in itself. While we can attain truth from our perspective, absolute truth remains elusive. Hegel, in contrast, rejects this limitation, finding it counterintuitive that we cannot access the world in itself. Why do we have the conviction that our understanding of the world is accurate? It can be prone to errors, challenging, and acquired through persistent effort, but there's a potential for truth. In the modern era, there's a sense that we are continually refining and deepening our comprehension of the world. There's an inclination to believe that we can endlessly expand our knowledge. Hegel finds this notion of infinite expansion intriguing and focuses on this continuous and boundless progress. Hegel's viewpoint rejected the notion that humans are merely mechanistic entities, isolated like cogs. Instead, he argued that we are intricately connected to the universe and the natural world, engaging in reflection upon it. We constitute an essential component of the broader reality. Consequently, Hegel dismissed the idea of a strict division between ourselves and the world, between subject and object, or between reason and Kant's thing in itself. According to Hegel, we are an extension of the universe, eliminating such separations. The philosopher's task in this context involves unraveling the relationship between the universe's substance, its perpetual universality, and the individual's specific finite existence. Hegel affirms what Kant denies, the possibility of having knowledge through pure reason of the absolute or the unconditioned. In the deterministic universe, causes lead to effects which in turn lead to more causes and effects. Everything is conditioned by something else. To comprehend the world, one must understand this intricate web of relationships. Absolute knowledge entails knowing these wider causes and having more detailed knowledge within its context. Spinoza considered nature and God to be essentially synonymous. It wasn't that God was out there transcendent, separate from the universe. Instead, God was imminent, revealed in every atom and every thought, as all is conditioned by the absolute first cause. Kant would say, hold on, why delve into discussions about God, metaphysics and absolute answers? Philosophy should focus on what is immediately perceptible to the senses. Only then can a genuine science be established. Hegel strongly disagreed, asserting that Kant was fearful, terrified of the thing in itself, hesitant to explore beyond his immediate surroundings. Hegel argued that Kant constructed a barrier, a limit between knowledge and the absolute because of this fear. This is what Kant referred to as the separate sphere, the noumenal realm. On the other hand, Hegel's inquiry into the relationship between the subject and substance explores how we can effectively express this connection. Hegel is in pursuit of complete unity, comprehensive knowledge, and contented happiness that does not feel estranged in an empty space, but instead feels at home in the world. He envisions the world as an organic unity that encompasses us, our ideas, others, animals, history, and everything within it. Hegel contends that through a meticulous examination of the process, we can grasp our intrinsic connection to the overarching historical movement. An exploration of Hegel's philosophy begins by questioning the essence of reflecting on the world. Reflection, akin to a mirror, implies a form of doubling. When contemplating my thoughts about the world, I engage in a circular process where consciousness reflects on itself as self-consciousness. The act of reflection implies stepping outside oneself to self-examine, but it also involves distancing from the world to contemplate it. Reflection implies an unfolding process, making Hegel an idealist as he examines our evolving ideas about the world. 
He asserts that our experiences are molded by these changing ideas, and the various forms of consciousness undergo transformations over the course of history. The crucial question is, how does this transformation happen, and is there a discernible logic to it? Hegel argues that our understanding is restricted only if we consider things in isolation. No discipline, set of practices, ideas, job or hobby is coherent in isolation. The expertise of a lumberjack, carpenter, and architect only gains meaningful significance when considered in relation to one another. Comprehending their interconnections yields a more comprehensive and absolute system of thought. So, let's summarize our current understanding. We recognize the limited individual within the all-encompassing universe or substance, the interplay between the subject and the object, and the coexistence of the finite and the infinite. Kant introduced the notion that our knowledge is constrained due to our limitations as beings, preventing us from comprehending the thing in itself. However, Hegel contends that genuine knowledge entails fully grasping what we know and situating it within the absolute. This is where Hegel initiates his exploration, beginning with straightforward conscious thoughts, progressing to self-consciousness, evolving into reason, then advancing to spirit and culminating in absolute knowing. Hegel asserts that as beings driven by thought and a quest for truth, our desire is to have immediate knowledge of the world. However, he observes that particulars inevitably move beyond their immediate nature and become universal. The immediate transforms into the mediated. The paradox arises when we contemplate how a whole can be composed of parts. It's a peculiar concept, and upon closer examination of our perception, it appears that the process is intrinsic to our act of thinking. When we analyze and deconstruct an object into its components, and then reconstruct it as a whole, it is an activity originating within ourselves, for example when I pick up an object from the ground, noting its hardness, weight, and rough round shape, I label it as a rock. These ideas of properties, relationships and universals, are in essence aspects from my perspective. Hegel posits that every object leads a dual existence, lacking complete independence. The notion that we can perceive an object in a pure and unadulterated manner, devoid of connections to external ideas, concepts and entities, swiftly loses credibility. Hegel suggests that perception is inherently complex. Objects are interconnected within a complex web of relations to other entities, in the realm of sense certainty. Understanding an object necessitates looking beyond the object itself. Every object holds a relation to something else, be it the rock's connection to the ground or the bird's association with the tree. This understanding demands a considerable amount of contextual information. Contrary to common belief, that direct experience provides the purest and most immediate knowledge. Hegel challenges this notion asserting that such experiential knowledge is in fact the most vaguest form of understanding. Even in its simplest form, understanding necessitates moving beyond direct experience and delving into broader concept. By transcending perception and contemplating relationships, a network of interconnections emerges. Objects are conditioned by and interact with other elements, possessing a historical context with origins and potential destinations. As these concepts are intertwined, the recognition of laws governing the relationship between the internal and external aspects of an object becomes apparent. Objects, according to Hegel, exhibit a dual nature with concealed dynamics that can be comprehended. A core tenet of Hegel's philosophy is that the particular comes first in existence and the universal comes first in explanation. To comprehend any object and its historical context, we find ourselves incorporating a considerable amount into the absolute. Furthermore, whatever positive elements we include appear to be influenced, are influenced by what negates them by external factors. When something is determined by an external factor, we are compelled to broaden our definition. The absolute beckons us, 
As sense certainty and individual objects are shaped by external influences, prompting us to widen our perspective. Hegel contends that there is no need to enforce a method. Rather, a natural process unfolds by attentively engaging with experience, being, logic, and ethics. This process emerges as a dynamic movement, embodying both life and thought. Each instance in which consciousness endeavors to establish an absolute understanding of an object, keeping in mind that an object can encompass anything, even an idea, the concept we grasp appears to be driven forward by its inherent logic. Hegel characterizes this as a continuous push or an inclination toward genuine knowledge, a phenomenon he identifies with desire. There exists an innate yearning, a passion for acquiring knowledge. Hegel's goal is to transform philosophy from the love of knowing into actual knowing. Through the necessity of referring to something outside of itself, a concept develops to include what was previously excluded. This dialectical process not only results in a new concept, but one that is higher and richer than the preceding. It negates or opposes the preceding concept while also containing it. This unity of opposites is what Hegel refers to as sublation, or verben in German. Sublation involves cancelling, but at the same time to preserve, to lift up. It's the process through which the negation, the element that negates the positive definition of the concept, is included in a new form of the concept. Hegel describes it as the negation of negation, or determinate negation. This concept of the world confronts the Kantian thing in itself. However, if our concept is not entirely accurate, the real substance of the universe intrudes and challenges the boundaries of ideas. This dynamic interaction is the essence of dialectical movement. Hegel characteristically observes the dialectical sequence as follows. 1. Affirmation. 2. Negation. And 3. The negation of negation, which results in the affirmation of something new. As mentioned earlier, any attempt to conceptualize an object without involving myself in the process failed, without my act of looking, searching, touching, and perceiving, the object is nothing. This is why Hegel needs to turn to the individual. From your perspective, every experience is just given to you. It's for you in the sense that all your senses are directed by you, shaping your concepts and experiences. What directs this? According to Hegel, it's simple will choice, and desire. My desire moves me. It's like energy. However, our desire, our self-consciousness, appears to lack inherent content. Desire is perpetually directed towards some external object or idea. Thus, desire is contingent on something foreign, whether it's the intention to gaze at a particular object, contemplate an idea, consume specific food, or drink a particular beverage. There's a disconcerting recognition that despite our control over things, we are also reliant on them. Self-consciousness possesses a remarkable structure analogous to the examination of objects discussed earlier. To scrutinize ourselves, we must extend beyond our own boundaries to consider other self-consciousnesses. When conscious experience is turned inward toward the self, it becomes pure desire. In this context, all other things act as the negating force as desire functions as the mechanism through which the self strives to eliminate the otherness of the external world and assert its own existence. In the realm of self-consciousness, characterized by a continuous stream of objects and thoughts, Hegel argues that there is no genuine self to be found. According to him, the authentic experience of self-consciousness necessitates the presence of another self-conscious entity. This recognition occurs when encountering an object, another self-consciousness, that cannot be discarded, destroyed, or consumed. In the context of self-consciousness, recognition plays a pivotal role. When someone acknowledges and recognizes me, I develop a conceptual understanding of myself as an entity recognized by the external world. Previously, my self-perception consisted of either an empty consciousness 
or a series of objects in my thoughts. However, the shift occurs when my self-concept transforms into an object, an idea of me that is shared by the world. According to Hegel, the two selves acknowledge each other's recognition, and true self-consciousness emerges when the self recognizes itself as being recognized by another. This section of Hegel's work is crucial, as it signifies the inception of spirit, where the individual I transforms into a collective we that becomes a determining factor in the world. In this phase, I realize that my self-concept is shaped not just by my own desires, but also by external objects and by the perception of me held by another self-consciousness. I attempt to establish my identity based on everything I know and all the ideas I possess. However, in this process, I encounter an idea of myself as an entity that I cannot control. Hegel expresses that self-consciousness holds a dual nature. It is absolute in its certainty about itself, yet, in the eyes of others, it becomes a tangible object, an independent entity existing in the realm of being. This discrepancy needs to be reconciled on both sides, because each self-consciousness simultaneously serves as a living entity in the perception of others, and as an unwavering self-certainty in its own perspective. The foundation of self-consciousness, rooted in desire, involves an independent and self-propelled drive to assert one's will. However, Hegel introduces a crucial nuance, emphasizing the necessity for each self-consciousness to recognize the autonomy of the other as a subjective entity with its own independent existence, thus resisting manipulation for personal end. In the struggle for recognition, each self-consciousness seeks to establish the absolute nature of its desire. This dynamic creates a life-and-death struggle, as both parties desire acknowledgement from the other. The intricate questions that emerge include determining leadership, strength, the correctness of ideas, and the ultimate dominance in the conflict. The confrontation revolves around actions that substantiate the claim of being the one with rightful authority. The concept of recognition has significantly influenced proto-psychological theories. Jean Hippolyte suggests that while historians may identify various causes for conflict, the core motive often lies in the struggle for acknowledgement, rather than the apparent reasons cited. The struggle for recognition involves testing the boundaries of what is achievable, determining who can succeed in various situations. Ultimately, this leads to a power dynamic where one asserts dominance, while the other assumes a subordinate role. In Hegel's view, self-consciousness is the focal point, and it faces the challenge of refusing to acknowledge another as a free being. While simultaneously striving to garner recognition from the other self-consciousness, establishing itself as independent, the individual self cannot tolerate the independence of the other, leading them inevitably into a conflict. Inevitably, one emerges victorious while the other assumes a subordinate position. One poses the questions, the other provides the answers. Throughout history, this dynamic plays out with one assuming the role of master and the other as servant. However, Hegel contends that this configuration of self-consciousness is unsatisfactory for both the master and the servant. The master is only acknowledged by the servant, who lacks autonomy and could be disposed of at will. Consequently, being recognized by something that lacks value or respect diminishes the significance of recognition itself. We start to observe the complexity of autonomy in this situation. Although the servant has relinquished some autonomy and freedom by serving the master, they come to recognize their intrinsic value. While carrying out the master's commands, they have command over the realm of objects, possessing knowledge of work, their environment, food, cooking, and the procedures they need to undertake. In certain respects, the servant may even possess more knowledge than the master. Even though consciousness may not be acknowledged as entirely free, constrained in its movement, speech and actions, one aspect where it is self-determined is in thinking. Hegel initiates an examination of historical instances where self-consciousness evolves into an intersubjective state. 
This marks the commencement of history happening to consciousness in a genuine sense. The master-servant relationship introduces a historical dimension, characterized by domination and introspection, into the essence of freedom within an intersubjective context. Hegel illustrates the responses of Stoicism and skepticism in the ancient world to this particular form of consciousness. Autonomy faces contradictions on all fronts, with self-consciousness being subject to external forces. The Stoic and the skeptic react by turning inward, retreating into a fortress of solitude. They adopt a stance of denial, asserting that everything external holds no significance for them. In their pursuit, they seek ataraxia, a state of unperturbedness, placing their trust solely in their own thoughts as the only truly free element. The Stoics declare, External events are irrelevant to me. I have absolute control over my thoughts. Its goal is to sustain an unresponsive indifference that steadfastly disengages from the chaos of existence. The skeptic, in contrast, lacks a distinct content of their own. They too adopt an inward focus, distancing themselves from the external world. Their responses are either a simple, yes, no, or I don't believe that. Everything appears as a jumbled mixture for them, characterized by the perpetual confusion of self-generated disorder. Stoics and skeptics reject everything that is presented to them. According to Hegel, in ancient Rome where Stoicism emerged, the world was immersed in melancholy and its heart was shattered. In a different context, he describes ancient Rome as the universal unhappiness of the world. This, he asserts, is akin to the dark night of the soul. Self-consciousness is bereft of hope, disillusioned, and the skeptic perceives the world as contingent, mutable, and uncertain. This marks the emergence of a new form, the unhappy consciousness. It longs for assurance and wisdom, but finds itself in a despondent condition. Isolated from the world, it employs its own self to scrutinize every experience, dwelling in a realm of bondage, despair, and uncertainty. In this context, religion enters the scene for the first time. When skepticism extends to everything but an acknowledgement of the existence of an absolute universal, one is left with faith, a profound sentiment through the heart. According to Hegel, the unhappy consciousness recognizes its own frailty as sinful and places its trust in a god of the universal. We relinquish our individuality. We abandon possessions, wealth, and indulgence. Feeling ashamed of our limited selfhood, we turn our gaze toward the universal idea, believing that everything originates from this transcendent realm. A mediator, the priest, steps onto the stage, asserting a unique link to the universal. We voluntarily surrender our own will, entrusting it to the priest, who serves as the go-between connecting the individual, with their finite existence, to the boundlessly universal God. At this point, Hegel delves into an analysis of Christianity. The unhappy consciousness posits a God that is absent, a God that as an unhappy consciousness I cannot access. But this cannot stand. Remember for Hegel, the absolute is not transcendent. It's not separate, out there, but imminent, running through everything. We cannot be separate from God, whether secularized or theological, because God contains all relations within, being omnipresent and omnipotent. The unhappy consciousness bears resemblances to Kant's concept of reason as both emerge from a religious mode of thought. They both posit a realm beyond a privileged space detached from the tangible world. The guiding notion for the unhappy consciousness is that Jesus has died and God has forsaken humanity. While the prospect of reaching heaven exists, the earthly condition is marred by sin. The spiritual realm transcends everyday experience, positioned as something beyond, separate above and unattainable in contrast to the tangible present. Kant, in a somewhat similar vein, concurred with the religious individual that engaging in universal thinking holds a distinctive quality that sets it apart from the earthly realm. 
both the unhappy consciousness and Kant's reason, create a separation between us and the world. However, Hegel in essence disagrees. According to him, reason is not detached, it is involved and connected. It passionately asserts, the world is mine. Hegel describes it as advancing, confidently establishing its authority on every summit and in every depth. For Kant, we are stuck viewing the world through our framework, and to know the thing in itself is impossible. Hegel says that Kant builds a boundary between cognition and the absolute because he fears it. Hegel points out that we need the thing in itself. The dialectical process takes the logic of the thing in itself and slowly unfolds in a relationship to it. While Kant might be right that our perspective bends the world, on the other hand, Hegel argues that Kant neglects to explore how this perspective throughout history, and through logic, can be unbent. Kant examines enlightenment reason, and its aspiration to comprehend various phenomena, such as falling bodies, chemical reactions, animals, plants, planets, and more. According to him, knowledge is aimed at understanding the essence of things as they are. But while the rock may not understand why trees can't grow on it, and the bird may lack knowledge of the physics of flight, for Hegel, he argues reason organizes empirical studies into a broader system of thought that transcends simple nature, indicating something more profound. Reason engages in self-reflection, attempting to study itself, similar to how self-consciousness seeks self-understanding. However, when reason turns inward, it doesn't find a neat arrangement of logical elements, but instead, as William James puts it, a bustling confusion of half-formed thoughts, memories, regrets, and images. The question arises, is reason inherently reasonable, or is its character influenced by circumstances, situations, habits, customs, religion, and other factors? Reason operates in two realms— the external world of phenomena, where the laws of cause and effect seem to govern physics, chemistry, and biological processes, and the internal world of psychology, where concepts like passion, freedom, and choice take center stage. When we examine our own psychologies, the notion of psychological necessity, according to Hegel, becomes an empty expression. Reason in Hegel's view is not a detached and unfeeling force. Instead, it is imbued with interest and takes on a persona. It becomes romantic, possessing motivations, reaching out into the world, and finding embodiment. When engaging with the world, it's not merely about observation, but about action and creation. Hegel argues that reason desires happiness and finds it entirely reasonable to pursue. However, it also seeks to witness its own happiness manifested in the external world. We see this intertwining of reason manifest as romanticism, and the enlightenment is evident in the collective rebellion against unjust and irrational laws imposed by arbitrary aristocrats and monarchs. Rousseau introduces the concept of the law of the heart, claiming that reason perceives itself as right based on an inner conviction. According to this view, one believes they are correct because they feel it strongly. However, Hegel adds that when consciousness establishes the law of its heart, it inevitably faces opposition from others. This resistance emerges because it contradicts the equally particular laws of the heart of the other. We all desire our own things, convinced of our correctness. Therefore, morality cannot solely originate from individual feelings. So, Kant flips the concept of morality, defining it as what is universalizable. Morality isn't an emotional warmth, but a rational calculation. The law of the heart transforms into the law of duty. What is right can only be transformed into a universal rule. My personal desires are repressed. The idealist envisions a world where everyone acts in the right way. However, the challenge for the idealist lies in suppressing selfish desires and individuality traits. On the contrary, according to Hegel, the world isn't driven by duty, abstract ideas, or universal rules, 
but rather the world is driven by individuality. The idealist advocates against selfishness asserting that selflessness is virtuous and the universal ideal. According to the idealist, the world would improve if everyone embraced selflessness. However, Hegel introduces its negation, the way of the world, which suggests that sometimes one needs to prioritize selfishness. Reason is inherently concerned with both its own well-being and the well-being of others. Even when proposing a universal concept, such as selflessness, reason must express that selflessness through individual actions. Active reason gains self-assurance and relies on its own rationality to guide actions. It doesn't require guidance from kings or priests, but rather, individuals as models of reason utilizing their unique gifts and talents acting like mini-gods, to contribute to the greater good and benefit the broader world. During Hegel's era, there was a lack of intellectual concepts such as social consciousness, the unconscious, or sociology. The notion of the general will, as introduced by Rousseau, was a relatively recent development, and so it is challenging to precisely define Hegel's concept of Geist or spirit and its all-encompassing process. However, philosopher R. C. Solomon suggests that what becomes evident from Hegel's writings is that Geist refers to a kind of shared or common general consciousness that is present in all individuals. Let's delve into the concept of self-consciousness, needing two self-consciousnesses, and explore how traditions and customs emerge from this, leading to what Hegel terms the unity of different independent self-consciousnesses. As we have discussed, in the struggle for recognition, two self-conscious beings engage in a life-and-death battle. Seeking acknowledgement from each other, the winner gains a sense of self-worth and recognition, while the defeated acknowledges the superiority of the victor. This struggle sets the stage for the development of traditions and customs. Traditions and customs emerge as a way for self-conscious beings to regulate their interactions and establish stable patterns of recognition. Through repeated interactions and mutual recognition, a shared understanding develops, giving rise to customs and traditions that govern the behavior of individuals within a group of people. While each individual maintains their independent self-consciousness, they also contribute to and are shaped by the collective self-consciousness of the group of people. This interplay between individuality and community forms the basis for the development of ethical life. According to Hegel, the shared customs, traditions and ethical norms provide a framework within which self-conscious individuals can coexist and find recognition. Geist represents the collective consciousness or spirit of a community. It goes beyond individual self-consciousness and encompasses the shared values, customs and ideals that define a society. Geist is not a static entity. Rather, it embodies the dynamic interplay between individual minds and the broader cultural, social and historical context. Hegel looks to the Persians, Egyptians, China and other civilizations, but for Hegel ancient Greece is the beginnings of world history. He says that in Greece, the way ethical life was experienced was just a simple thisness, what he describes as the unwritten and infallible law of the gods. In this context, Hegel points to ethicality or the communal essence in its most straightforward and pristine manifestation. The Greeks embrace this communal and ethical existence without the need for analysis or questioning. It is a state of being, a way of life that they effortlessly embody and immerse themselves in. According to Hegel, the ethical life in ancient Greece was characterized by harmony and equilibrium. It represented a form of uncomplicated freedom where each individual acted according to their own internal law described as a beautiful individuality. This simplicity extended to the political organization of the city-state, creating, for a fleeting moment, an idyllic and democratic ancient Greece. The ethical life of ancient Greece resembled a well-crafted work of art, where all elements harmoniously balanced together. Every individual enjoyed democratic participation in governance, and beyond that, 
They were free to pursue their own endeavors. However, this apparent wholeness concealed underlying contradictions that contributed to its eventual decline. Greek society was characterized by slavery, with slaves and women excluded from active participation in public life. Freedom, in this context, was often equated with self-sufficiency, primarily defined as avoiding enslavement. Aristotle noted that true freedom involved not being subject to the commands of others. The growth of Greek city-states faced limitations, as their democratic constitutions were feasible only in small states. The necessity of the ideal of self-sufficiency, coupled with the requirement for face-to-face -face interaction for their political life, constrained the size of the polis. While this arrangement allowed for common education and vibrant democracy, it also rendered the Greek polis too small to defend itself effectively. Consequently, when confronted by a more organized and powerful empire, the Greek city-states lacked the capacity and motivation to resist. In Hegel's view, the decline of ancient Greece marks the historical Eden from which modern humanity has fallen. The notion of freedom marked a significant breakthrough signifying a departure from the previous paradigm where only a ruler enjoyed freedom, while everyone else served. Now, the idea emerged that multiple individuals, including slaves and women who were previously excluded, could experience freedom collectively. According to Hegel, building on the master-servant dynamic, freedom is rooted in acknowledgement. The acknowledgement that as a free individual, such as the Athenian, certain rights are inherent. Rome drew valuable lessons from this historical progression. Recognizing the significance of individuality, Rome established a sophisticated legal framework. Individuals were endowed with specific property rights and the entitlement to a trial in Rome. Through this legal system, Rome extended citizenship to conquered territories, enabling its expansion in a manner not feasible for Greece. Unlike Greek city-states, Rome opened up the potential universality of citizenship. Theoretically, certain aspects of citizenship were accessible to all, even allowing women to legally own property. Individuals from distant cities could also become citizens with protected rights. Rome could undertake a universal mission that surpassed the capabilities of Greek city-states. However, Rome's orientation was centered on the concept of conquest, constituting its primary purpose. According to Hegel, in the absence of conquest, Roman life lacked substantial ethical communal principles that could bind the spirit of Rome together. He observed a lack of content in Roman life. The Greeks discovered meaning and purpose in public life in a manner that the Romans struggled to achieve. Pinkard suggests that what the Romans lacked was something akin to the essential requirement for a defined social-political space, offering its members a fundamental orientation in life. Power, meaning, choices, and decisions. The zeitgeist was centralized in the will of the Roman emperor, the lord of the world, as Hegel calls him. Pinkard writes, For the Roman shape of life, being a subject was simply being a member of the Roman legal order with all of its complicated divisions among local laws, imperial laws, and the like. There was no further essence, as it were, to subjectivity. This is why for Hegel, Stoicism rises out of Rome. It was natural for Romans to want to distance themselves psychologically from the arbitrariness, the brutality, the slavishness of the Roman world, and instead focus on inner life, inner thought, inner virtue. This was both an insight and a contradiction of Rome, but ultimately it contributed its collapse. The ancient world's problem was that they struggled with the question of how individuals come together into a collective, cohesive whole. But they did at least begin to pose the question. They made it one of importance, one we should also think through. The absence of an ethical whole is the soil out of which culture grows. What does culture have to do with spirit? The idea of what it means to be cultured is important to Hegel. It's a question of meaning. To be cultured means to leave my individuality and become something else. To become cultured 
is to become something spirited, to be civil, to become polite, to think about customs and laws, to become a universal being. Culture speaks quite clearly of that divide between individuality and universality. Remember that, for Hegel we're talking about the idea of culture, a construct that we posit ourselves. He says it's that which consists precisely in being conscious of two different worlds and which embraces both. And so he calls it self-alienated spirit. It's both external and internal, but because it's an idea, the external is internal too. It's the self's alienation from itself, positing its own negation as outside of itself, but as part of its ethical constitution. Hegel writes, Nothing has a spirit that is grounded within itself, an indwelling, but each is outside itself in something alien. When we think about the out there, of communal spirits, we go outside of ourselves in ourselves. But what we crave, what we desire, what fuels dialectical movement, is the idea of subject and object, individual and culture, being one. So that we feel no painful divide between our own desires and what's imposed culturally. What consciousness wants is that, through the general will, the individual obeys laws that he himself has authorized. Law, in this sense, is not external to the individual, but emanates from him. This is evident in the Enlightenment, when it was argued that it wasn't kings or gods or even tradition that was the source of right, but people themselves, that we together are the source of culture, the source of rights and ideas of liberty, equality and fraternity. As the French revolutionary said, in this, they are universal and individual at the same time. Hegel says self-consciousness needs duty to be the absolute essence. Didn't we learn from previous shapes of consciousness that there is no universal object out there without looking at the subject in here? Kant's morality has much in common with the unhappy consciousness. It posits the good in some transcendental region that is almost separate from me. Instead, Hegel says we must look for the source of culture, morality, the good and duty within. It must align with our own impulses, our own individual ideas, our own talents, wants and personal preferences. Duty must become an individual drive rather than an abstract thought. Personal will and communal duty must become the same. Hegel says, It's now the law that is for the sake of the self, not the self that's for the sake of the law. We see this expressed in the great interest in emotion, passion, and moral sentiment during the Enlightenment. We forget that this was a period of individual expression and an interest in overflowing emotion as much as it was about reason. We need to place morality so that it aligns with the individual's desire. For the driving force of spirit, we need, in a phrase, a moral will to power. What do you have when you understand the dialectical processes just laid out? How do you think when you understand the logical shapes of consciousness, self-consciousness, reason, geist and religion? What happens when you comprehend where you stand and understand what your place is in this great unfolding? You have speculative philosophy. Absolute knowing is that speculative philosophy. But now it's systematic. Absolute knowing understands the rationality of all previous shapes of consciousness as the self-differentiating work of the concept. It's the perspective of the concept that moves itself as concept. It's not just the universal ideas that I have personally. In Hegel's era, the term science, Wissenschaft in German, did not solely refer to contemporary empirical sciences like experiments, inventions, and physics as we understand it today. Instead, Science encompassed a broader scope, often used interchangeably with philosophy. This concept of Wissenschaft involved the systematic pursuit of knowledge, including ethics, metaphysics, and more. It aimed to establish a comprehensive philosophical system where everything could be understood when placed on suitable foundation. Absolute knowing recognizes that all things are in a continuous process of development within a systematically organized framework, ensuring that over time, 
integration, unity, rationality, balance, freedom, reconciliation, and self-awareness are achieved. Democracy, understood within the dialectical process, involves the governance by the people and the continuous development of the concept. This process engages in a dialectical interplay between the finite object and the absolute idea, incorporating all concepts to gain understanding and coherence. The phenomenology of spirit initially recognizes the various forms of knowledge distributed over time and subsequently rearranges them to highlight their logically inevitable connections, analogous to reflecting on one's own life. Where a sequence of actions may only gain clarity in hindsight, with insights, analysis, and self-understanding, it becomes possible to discern the reasons behind one's choices, identify significant experiences, and distinguish formative elements from those that were not. Through this retrospective perspective, one can string together the events and actions, gaining a comprehensive understanding. Absolute knowing is the state where the self achieves complete transparency to itself through the understanding of all preceding forms of consciousness. In this state, it recognizes that it embodies the truth of substance. And, conversely, substance represents the truth of the self. Absolute knowing emerges from a foundation of religion, preserving the authentic aspects of religious shapes while transforming them into a philosophical framework. Despite the truths and structure found in Christianity, it still perceives God as separate. Absolute knowing corrects this misconception, acknowledging that the thinking subject itself possesses a divine nature. The interchange between self and object signifies that we are interconnected with the universe. The unfolding of the universe and the evolving relationship between subject and object contribute to the acquisition of knowledge about the universe. The purpose of history becomes apparent only after numerous shapes, events, battles, processes, ideas, and actions have unfolded. Reflecting on these occurrences becomes possible only at dusk, symbolizing the end of the day. It is then that observers can discern potential relationships, understand the connections between ideas and concepts, and move forward in comprehension. Hegel aptly expresses this idea by stating, the owl of Minerva spreads its wings only with the falling of the dusk, emphasizing the retrospective nature of understanding events. Despite the apparent chaos, reason, according to Hegel, exhibits a cunning ability to discern patterns and reveal meaningful connections 